Well, you know, as a pastor, you often get to be with people during the very best times in their lives. And I love it uh, when they get married, when they dedicate their children, when they're baptized, of course, when they decide to follow Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, there's nothing better than being able to celebrate the best times in life with people you love, right? And of course, uh, there's another side to that. The other side to that is the fact that you're also often with people during the very worst times of their lives, when, when people are going through uh, a divorce, right? People struggling with severe addictions, abuse, failing health, a, a death in the family. And of course, the list goes on and on and on. And although as the church we certainly pray for God to move on behalf of hurting people, right? We, we pray for restoration and deliverance and healing and comfort and all of those situations. But, but when people come to see their pastor outside of prayer, it's typically not to try and uh, uh, you know, negotiate the terms of their divorce, right? Attorneys do that. When there's active abuse taking place in the home, generally speaking, pastors aren't the ones who physically remove the abuser from the home. Police do that. When, when someone's health is failing, uh, again, outside of prayer, people don't normally seek medical treatment from their pastors because doctors do that. Okay, the reason that people go to their pastor during incredibly difficult times in their lives is because they are carrying the weight of those burdens and they're looking for emotional, sometimes intellectual, but more than anything, spiritual support to hopefully alleviate some of the weight of those burdens, which can otherwise become unbearable, right? Sometimes the weight becomes more than we can bear alone, which is why the Apostle Paul instructs us to bear one another's burdens in Galatians 6, 2. And so it is right to come to your pastor, yes, of course, to your brothers and sisters in Christ with those heavy things that we all carry at times in our lives. And certainly uh, there are burdens that we were meant to carry, right? Paul expresses an almost overwhelming burden for the lost in the first five verses of Romans 9, those who have yet to know Jesus Christ. So yes, we should be burdened for the lost. We should also be burdened for one another when a fellow brother or sister in Christ is hurting. Speaking of the church, the Apostle Paul said, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So yes, there are burdens that we were meant to bear and to share with one another. But listen, so much of what we often carry in our lives, we were never meant to carry. God never wanted us to bear the weight and the effects of sin in this world. No, as sons and daughters, we were chosen before the foundations of the earth to become fellow heirs with Christ, according to the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 17 to be a chosen race, according to the Apostle Peter, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 1 Peter 2.9. In fact, in his letter to the Gentile Christians in Galatia, Paul wrote, In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise, Galatians 3, 26 through 29. If you are in Christ, you are Abraham's offspring. Heirs according to the promise. Keep that in mind as we read this passage in Genesis where God says to Abraham, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Genesis 17, 7. That's us. He made a promise to Abraham and his offspring that I will be your God and you will be my people. He made that statement to Moses in Exodus 29, 45 and 46, and he added to it that I will dwell 
among them. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. He said it to Moses again in Leviticus 26, 11 and 12. To Jeremiah, he said, they shall be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good. And I will plant them in this land in faithfulness with all my heart and all my soul. Jeremiah 32, 38 through 41. In Jeremiah 31, 33, he says it again. I will be their God and they shall be my people. To Ezekiel, he said, my dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Ezekiel 37, 27 and 28. To Zechariah, he said, sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people and I will dwell in your midst and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Zechariah 2, 10 and 11. And in case you think these are just Old Testament promises, in 2 Corinthians 6, 16, the Apostle Paul says to the Gentile Christians in Corinth, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Paul is directly quoting God's Old Testament promise and applying it to us today. And if that's not enough to convince you in Revelation 21, 3, we hear it directly from heaven itself. As the Apostle John writes, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. From Genesis to Revelation... From the first age of this earth to the very last, God's word makes it abundantly clear that his intention is to be our God, a God who is always with us and a God who rejoices in doing good to us. We were never meant to carry the weight of sin in this world. The weight that so many people carry around in their lives every day, God never wanted us to carry that. But because mankind rejected him all the way back in the Garden of Eden, the burden of sin was thrust upon this world, which is now a broken place full of spiritually dead people. It's a broken place because of sin. The Apostle John said the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, 1 John 5, 19. And it is full of spiritually dead people because they are lost in their sin. The Apostle Paul said, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind." Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. This world is a broken place and it's full of spiritually dead people. Now listen, the good news is that Jesus Christ came to change that. He said the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, Luke 19, 10. And so now within this world, this broken place full of spiritually dead people, you have the church which is a family made up of people who were once spiritually dead, but are now spiritually alive in Christ. If you keep reading that passage in Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5 say, But God, being rich in mercy, 
because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. You understand that is the Old Testament promise being fulfilled in our lives today through Jesus Christ, who said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. In other words, I am your God and you are my people. Just as the Father knows me, Jesus said, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. John 10, 10 through 15, he laid his life down for us. By taking our burden of sin upon himself, he bore our sins so that we no longer have to. It's why he was able to say, come to me, come all who labor and are heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. He bore our sins so that we no longer have to. So that we no longer have to. God never wanted us to carry the burden of sin. And now because of Jesus Christ, we don't have to. So why, Christian? Why are you still carrying that burden when it is not yours to carry? Why do we allow the effects of sin in this world to weigh us down to the point that we no longer walk in the fullness of life that he created us to live in? And furthermore, why would those in the world ever want to become a part of the church if all they see when they look at us is broken, defeated, confused people who are straining just to stand under the weight of the very same burdens that plague those outside of the church. Okay, I'm not saying don't be concerned about your problems. Of course, we're all concerned about our problems. But look, because of Jesus Christ, we can do something about it. The Apostle Peter explains it in 1 Peter 5. 5 through 7, where he says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's the key here. We'll come back to that. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Do you understand? We're commanded to cast all of our anxieties, all of our cares, all of our burdens on him. It's not a suggestion. It is a command of God. And in fact, anything short of that, according to Peter, is nothing more than disobedience and pride. So listen, if you're holding on to a burden in your life today, Peter says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, the hand of the only one who can actually do something about it and then cast those burdens on him because they are not yours to carry. This is such a crucial lesson for us to learn in life, the, the willingness to cast off the burdens that you were never meant to bear as you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And I would add capable hand of God, knowing and believing and trusting that he cares for you enough to actually carry that burden for you. It is a lesson that God's people have had to learn throughout history, as we'll see in our story today, as we continue, uh, continue our sermon series, working our way through the book of Judges. And usually, of course, we work through an entire chapter each Sunday of whatever book we're studying. But today... We're simply going to look at the first five verses of chapter 2 because those five verses not only tell a complete story by themselves, 
but they also essentially encapsulate the message of the bulk of the rest of the chapter. So next week we'll probably pick the story back up uh, somewhere in the last part of chapter 2 and work our way into chapter 3 as the story continues from there. Okay? So for today, uh, let's begin reading together at Judges chapter 2 and we'll begin with the first three verses. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. So the angel of the Lord, uh, which by the way was probably a theophany, uh, an embodiment of God himself in human or angelic form because he speaks in the first person here. I brought you up out of Egypt and so on. So this theophany of God comes up from Gilgal to Bochum. And if you were here when we went through Joshua, you'll remember that Gilgal had become this defining place, an anchoring place for God's people. It was the place the Lord told Joshua to make a memorial by setting up 12 large stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel after they'd miraculously crossed the river Jordan by the mighty hand of God into the land of Canaan. And so they set up these 12 stones to commemorate the day when God made good on His promise to His people. In other words, God held up His end of their covenant agreement. Gilgal was also the place where God commanded Joshua to circumcise all the men of Israel in this new generation. Uh, From 20 years old and up, there were over 600,000 of them. He told them to do that as a sign of their commitment to the covenant with God. It was also the place where the people of God celebrated their first Passover in the promised land. And of course, ultimately, it became the headquarters and the central sanctuary location of the people of Israel, at least throughout their military conquest of Canaan. And so as if to emphasize and remind them of the covenant that was made between them, and as well to remind them of his own history of keeping his part of the covenant, the angel of the Lord comes up from Gilgal uh, to remind them what they've already been told, by the way, in Exodus 30, uh, 22, 32, um, in Exodus 34, 12, and 13, in Deuteronomy 12, 3, and, and, and even though this was a new generation... This was not new information for the Israelites as the angel of the Lord uses the plural form of the word you in the Hebrew when he says, I brought you up from Egypt. In other words, what I'm saying to you now applies to the entire nation of Israel and it always has, not simply this one generation. And so he comes up from Gilgal, this sacred place where he has proved his faithfulness time and again to the Israelites and he confronts them concerning their disobedience to that very same covenant. And so he says, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you've not obeyed my voice. In other words, I've not broken this covenant between us, but you, you and your pride have willfully broken this covenant between us because you decided you could carry the weight of a burden that was never yours to carry. You took upon yourselves the burden of the Canaanites instead of driving them out of the land as I commanded you to do. And so now, now I'm going to allow you to feel the weight of your disobedience. So now I say I will not drive them out before you but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. Interestingly, when you read that passage in the ancient Hebrew, when the angel of the Lord says, they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you, the word snare is the Hebrew word mokesh, which is a description of a snare or a trap that was very familiar to the Israelites. In fact, it's still used in Palestine today for catching birds. And so when the bird flies into the trap, it actuates a spring that causes the bird to be knocked down flat, pinned down, and pierced so that it can no longer move. 
It is quite a word picture that the angel was describing to the Israelites, and it was one that they would have very clearly understood. The fact that they were going to be pierced, pinned down by the burden of the Canaanites. Right? A burden, by the way, they were never meant to have to carry. And yet, as cruel as that may sound, for God to allow this to happen to His people, you have to understand this was actually a great act of mercy and love toward them. Okay? If he'd really wanted them to suffer, he could have just sent them to hell for all of eternity for breaking the covenant that they agreed to. And by the way, he would have been justified in doing so. But instead, he simply allowed them to feel the weight of that burden as a means of discipline. Why? Because of his great love for them. Okay? And just as God is immutable, meaning he never changes... His love for us is the same for His people today as it was then. Okay, for God's people, disobedience should always lead to discipline. That is how we learn. That is how we change. That is how we grow and mature and learn to trust in Him. Because listen, when you try to carry the burdens of this life that you were never meant to carry, God will let you. He will let you feel the weight of that burden, not as a means of punishment, but as a means of discipline because He loves you and He wants you to learn to cast your cares on Him. So when we try to carry those burdens, which, by the way, is nothing more than pride and disobedience, God says, okay, okay, I'm going to allow the weight of that burden to pin you down. To pierce your side, not because I want you to suffer, but because I want you to learn that you cannot bear the weight of those burdens that you were never meant to carry. So if you'll just cast that burden onto me, I will carry it for you so that you don't have to be pinned down by the weight of it any longer. I mean, honestly, doesn't that sound better to you than continuing to try and shoulder these burdens that we lug around in our lives every day, burdens that pierce us, they hurt us, burdens that pin us down, they limit our capacity to love others, they limit our ability to live for one another, they limit our freedom to become all that God created us to become because we're pinned down by the cares of this world. So why... Why in the world do we continue to carry these burdens around in our lives? Well, in part, it's because we don't really trust God to take them from us. We don't really trust Him to handle our burdens for us. We say we do. We say we trust God, but in practice, we haven't really learned to fully trust Him. Not if we're still hanging on to the same old burdens. Okay, listen, in Isaiah 41, 10 through 13, God said, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. I am the one who helps you. Look, you either believe that or you don't. Jesus asked his followers, which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? Matthew 6, 27. Well, I think I can answer that. None of us. Not one of us. So why do you continue to carry a burden that you were never meant to bear? It may be because you don't actually believe that God will take it from you. It's a lack of trust. Listen, generally speaking, we obey people for three reasons. 
Either we fear them or we love them or we trust them. Sometimes it's a combination of one or more of those reasons. And in fact, when it comes to God's people obeying Him, it should be a combination of all three of those. Scripture teaches us to fear God, to love God, and to trust God. But when it comes to this context of casting our cares on Him, our obedience in doing so usually comes down so often to a lack of trust. And listen, Peter and John and Paul and the other disciples, they all understood this very well because they'd all experienced the very same lack of trust at times in their own lives, which again is just a form of pride. And so Peter, who finally figured it out, he said, hey, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and cast all your anxieties on Him because it turns out He cares for you. You either believe that or you don't. And as long as you don't, He will allow you to feel the weight of those burdens as a means of discipline in your life. Let's read verse 4 as the Israelites react now to the discipline of the Lord. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. So the words of the angel of the Lord cut right to the heart of the people and they immediately react with great sorrow uh, for their sin, their pride, their disobedience. And so they begin to weep. In fact, Bochum, the name of the city where this was happening, is literally translated from the ancient Hebrew as weepers or weeping. So I don't personally think They would have named an entire city after their weeping if it wasn't both significant and sincere. Now, I'll just tell you, there are some scholars who take issue with that. Some who don't believe that these tears were actually genuine because the Israelites turn around later and sin against God again and again, as we'll see in the weeks to come. But listen, I don't think that argument necessarily holds water because how many times in our own lives do we sin against God And then with complete sorrow and sincerity, repent before him only to sin again at some point in the future. Why? Because we're flawed human beings. So I don't personally believe these tears from the Israelites were insincere at all just because they're again disobedient at some point in the future. At any rate, their response was so significant that they named the place after the weeping of the people, which was a completely appropriate response, by the way, because just as disobedience should always lead to discipline, for God's people, discipline should always lead to conviction. It's not the same thing uh, as repentance, by the way, as we'll see, but it is a step in the right direction, and it always precipitates repentance. Okay, Jesus, speaking of the Holy Spirit, said when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. John 16, 8. So it's the Holy Spirit's job to bring conviction. And yet, whether we allow ourselves to be affected positively or negatively by that conviction is a choice that we all have to make. Right? We can allow that conviction to break our hearts over our own sin or we can choose to harden our hearts and continue to sin. And when it comes to the burdens that we bear, I think what people often describe as feeling like they have the weight of the world on their shoulders is actually often the conviction of the Holy Spirit to turn that mess over to Him. So look, we can be attentive to that conviction and allow our hearts to break because of our own disobedience and hanging on to those burdens. Or we can dig our heels in and continue to shoulder that weight ourselves, not trusting or believing that God wants to or is able to handle that burden for us. Okay, in his letter, his first letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul brings harsh discipline to the church because of their disobedience. And the result, as we see in his second letter to the church, was conviction, which the Corinthians allowed to break their hearts over their sin. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 10, he says, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. 
For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Okay, look, godly grief is grief that leads us to once again seek God's approval when we've been disobedient. That is the righteous response to conviction. Worldly grief is grief that leads us to seek the world's approval when we've fallen out of favor with the world, which leads to judgment and ultimately death. So why do you continue to carry a burden that you were never meant to bear? Ask yourself, is it because I don't trust God to take it from me? And if that's not it, then ask yourself this question. Am I afraid of falling out of favor with the world if I let this thing go, this weight that has me pinned down? Because listen, the world will gladly heap burden after burden after burden onto your life and expect you to carry those burdens until they kill you. The truth is some people do just exactly that because they're afraid of falling out of favor with the world. All right, superficially, our culture wants us to shoulder the weight of having to look a certain way and live a certain way and to maintain a certain social status, right? And when it comes to politics, Lord, help us. Our culture demands that we take a stand on political issues and then defend them to the death. And listen, I vote. I believe in being politically active, but I am not required, expected, or even encouraged by God to shoulder the weight of what is happening in the White House. Right? There's enough going on in my own house every day that I carry as a father and a husband without having to carry the weight of something that I have absolutely no control over whatsoever. Outside of my vote... And whatever else I may be able to do in the political process in this country, I cannot control every decision going on in our government. So look, I'm not telling you to disengage from the process, but for your own sake, don't try to carry the burden of it because you cannot and should not bear that weight. The world nearly demands that of you. But God has much more pressing matters for you to be concerned with, namely the lost and dying in this world and the ongoing needs of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's at a surface level. Listen, on a much deeper level, when someone is lost, comes into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, sometimes those in the world don't want to let you forget who you were in your past. Listen to me, that is no longer your burden to bear. Jesus Christ is the only one that you need to please, and he has set you free from your past. And so I'm just telling you, my answer to those who disapprove of my radical devotion to Christ, and I have them in my life, my answer to them is, look, I'm sorry if you don't like the way I look. I'm sorry if you don't like the way I live. I'm sorry if you don't like the people I hang out with. I'm sorry if it bothers you that I don't melt down every time the political scene changes. But most of all, I'm sorry that you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ because he has taken every single one of those burdens off of me and set me free so that I can live the life that I was created to live. The convictions of this world Political correctness, social progressivism, moral relativism, religious pluralism, as self-inflated as these ideas have become, and boy have they ever, within our culture, they must all kneel in reverence before the convictions of a holy God who breaks hearts of stone and brings spiritually dead human souls back to life. Listen, don't allow the cares of this world to pin you down with burdens you were never meant to bear. Let's finish the story for today. Verse 5, as the people of God now act upon their conviction. 
And they called the name of that place Bochum, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. So again, uh, they named the place after the sorrow, the weeping that was expressed by the people as the angel of the Lord disciplines them for their disobedience. And out of that deep conviction comes action. Right before doing one more thing, the Israelites take the time to sacrifice bulls and rams, sin offerings, as a means of repentance. You see, they didn't merely feel sorry. They didn't just shed a lot of tears. They, they took that next crucial step in the process and repented for their disobedience. Okay, For God's people, disobedience should always lead to discipline. Discipline should always lead to conviction, and conviction should always lead to repentance. And to be clear, repentance isn't simply a state of mind or a feeling, although there certainly can be and often are sorrowful feelings and a a penitent or apologetic state of mind that accompanies repentance, right? And that's good, but repentance itself is a verb. It is an action. It's something we do. It's not just something we feel. And listen, it is the imperative response to conviction. If we stop at conviction, if we stop at feeling bad, if we stop at wishing we hadn't been disobedient, and all of that is good and right, but if we stop there without taking that next crucial step of actually repenting, then not only is there no forgiveness but the burden of sin that we carry remains. Pastor and theologian Kevin DeYoung said, if we preach a gospel with no call to repentance, we're preaching something other than the apostolic gospel. If we knowingly allow unconcerned, impenitent sinners into the membership and ministry of the church, we are deceiving their souls and putting ours at risk as well. If we think people can find a Savior without forsaking their sin, we do not know what sort of Savior Jesus Christ is. Few things are more important in life than repentance. It is so important that the Gospels and the Epistles and the Old Testament make clear that you don't go to heaven without it. Ezekiel said, repent and turn from your transgressions, Ezekiel 18.30. John the Baptist said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3, 2. Jesus said, repent and believe in the gospel, Mark 1, 15. Peter said, repent and be baptized, Acts 2, 38. And Paul said, God commands all people everywhere to repent, Acts 17, 30. So what exactly is repentance if not simply feeling sorrow or remorse? Well, when Jesus said, repent and believe in the gospel, that word repent in the ancient Greek is the word metanoia, which means a change of mind that results in a change of life. It is a verb, not an adjective. True repentance is a turning away from sin. It's releasing that burden that we are carrying. It is the forsaking of self so that we can follow Jesus Christ. So without it, without true repentance for the unbeliever, there's no forgiveness. There's no salvation. There's no freedom from this burden of sin that we were never meant to have to carry. And listen, repentance is for the believer as well as for the unbeliever, okay? For the Christian, although, of course, we've been saved by grace through faith. But we still sin, don't we? Our sanctification is a lifelong process that won't be complete until the next life after this one. And when we sin, we grieve the Holy Spirit, as the Apostle Paul points out in Ephesians 4. And one of the most common ways that Christians sin, one of the most common forms of disobedience for the believer, is hanging on to the burdens in this life that we were never meant to bear. But why? Why continue to carry a burden that we were never meant to carry? Why don't we cast all our anxieties on Him? It's because we either don't trust Him enough to take that burden from us, or we're more concerned with pleasing the world than we are with pleasing Christ, or we're not willing yet to die to ourselves because the prospect of a life free from those burdens actually frightens us. 
So we hang on to them because we've come to identify our sense of security and even our own identity with those burdens. As a pastor over the years, in fact, any pastor here will tell you this, I've counseled with many, many people who want to talk about and lament over the burdens in their lives, and they say they want to be free from those burdens. But the truth is some of those people have no intention of actually letting go of the weight that they're carrying, which becomes obvious over time when even through much counsel and prayer and assistance, there's no real effort to make a change of mind that results in a change of life. Why? Because they've allowed their very identity to become tied to those burdens to the point that deep down they're afraid to let them go. And I'm telling you, there's only one solution. Once you're honest with yourself and admit that you're holding on to those burdens, there's only one solution, and that is dying to yourself and in humble repentance once and for all, casting those burdens onto him. That's it. But you see, there you'll find freedom. There you will find healing. There is where you find wholeness. That is where you find peace. And there you will finally find the confidence and strength that you've been looking for because your identity is now found in Christ instead of in those burdens. You see, so much of what we carry in this life, we were never meant to carry. Jesus bore our sins so that we would no longer have to. So why do we allow the effects of sin in this world to weigh us down to the point that we no longer walk in the fullness of life that he created us to live in? He came to give us life in abundance. Why refuse to receive what he's freely offering us? Is it that you don't trust him? Is it that you're worried how the world will treat you if you do? Or is it that you simply haven't been willing to let that thing go because you're not sure what your life would be like without it? Well, listen to me. Whatever the reason, if you're holding on to a burden in your life today that is not yours to bear, that is sin in your life. That is disobedience to the word and to the command of God. And the only appropriate response to that disobedience is to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, the hand of the only one who can actually do something about that burden and then cast it onto him. Because listen, those burdens are not yours to carry. So why not let him? Why not let him bear those burdens? that you were never meant to bear. Let's pray.